Well, I want to thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, obviously, you were scraping the bottom of the barrel to call me just down the street to come over here. It was funny. It was reinforced to me when I came here a little early and Andrew had all of the CVs on his lap. And, of course, Dr. Richardson's was a textbook and Joe's looked like a magazine and mine was a pamphlet. <laughs> so, that uh, no pressure. So, uh, rather than talk about academic pursuits, let's talk about private practice a little bit. And I somewhat apologize for the somewhat inflammatory title there. I know it's very BuzzFeed ask when you talk about it, but uh, I think we'll have a positive outcome from it anyway. There are no relevant financial disclosures, but if you have any to offer me, I'd be happy to hear your pitch. <laughs> so at the completion of this presentation, we should be able to get an idea of why there's been a shift in private practice from self-employment to more employment by larger organizations. Identify at least some of the forces that may account for these changes in the workforce, and maybe discuss some potential ways forward for the private practice of general surgery. Now, We've got to start with our definitions, of course. Uh, private practice, kind of traditionally, we all have this idea in our mind of a shingle outside of a nice office that you'd go and visit your local general surgeon, and usually consisted of a solo practitioner, maybe a smaller group of practitioners who all had roughly the same specialty and would practice outside of an academic setting. And one other thing to kind of stress their independence was the fact that oftentimes these groups would work at multiple hospitals within a particular geographical area. So you wouldn't be necessarily tied down to one system or another, but depending on where the patient wanted to go, where you felt most comfortable to do those particular cases, you'd take your business to those places, and at the same time those places would compete to see if they could entice you to do more business in their hospital. But increasingly, as we see with this graph, there's been a shift of these non-academic surgeons from a traditional private practice model to one of employment. Now I should stress that although this graph looks pretty striking, some of the time in these measurements when they talk about a surgeon employee, they're talking about large single specialty groups where they're all considered employees uh, as opposed to just the self-employed surgeon. But nonetheless, we've seen this shift uh, quite pronounced. So seeing that, well who's employing these people? Where, what's the cause of this? And quite honestly, most of it is coming from the hospital. Between 2006 and 2011, as you can see here, 32% increase in the number of surgeons employed by hospitals. And I can tell you, if you follow this graph out even to today, that gap has increased dramatically. Increasingly, we're getting more and more hospital-owned practices and surgeons uh, than out in private practice again. Now, this is only going to increase with time. If you look at some of the medical administration literature, 74% of leaders in the hospital uh, administration are planning on actually increasing that physician employment. And you often see this being more pronounced in rural areas, in part due to the payer mix that you see. Just talking more locally or in our state, you know, I can think of groups in Richmond, Corbin, Moorhead, Georgetown, and even locally here that have been either bought out, sold their practices, or become hospital employees with an increasingly dwindling number of what you would call a typical independent practitioner. Now, why would a hospital do this? Why does a hospital want to employ a physician? Well, first of all, and most obviously, it helps drive referrals and procedures as well as both labs and radiology to their system. If you're an employee, they can tell you, send your business here, send your radiology studies to our outpatient center, you know, do your outpatient procedures in our outpatient center as well. And you know, the common refrain is if for a primary care provider, if you spend a dollar by the primary care provider, it actually leads to about six and a half dollars in downstream revenue for the system itself. It also, they would argue, it helps to coordinate care across multiple specialties and improve efficiency within the system. And that they find that once they bring a practice into their auspices, that those support expenses are about 40% lower if they're run by the hospital. And this also may help with the transition to newer care models, what we'll talk about in a second. Now, why would you become an employee? We're surgeons, we're trained to be independent thinkers. Why would we do this kind of thing? Well, first of all, as much as we talk about it, we really don't like the idea of running a practice. About 68 to 70 percent would say that the best thing about selling their practice is that they don't have to worry about all these overhead issues anymore, quite to the extent that they did before. And part of that is driven by just the fact that our expenses are increasing. There's been a 25 percent increase in just 2011 to 2015 that has continued to improve. Again, reimbursements didn't even come close to increasing at nearly the same rate for what you're doing. Things like the EMR, which has been federally mandated, of course, costs up to $70,000 per provision, per physician rather in a practice. I'd like to tell you that's all startup costs, but I can tell you it only drops to about $40,000 a year per physician just to maintain it, both with uh, support staff, uh, hardware and software upgrades. Typically, quite honestly, in the private world at least, when you become an employee, initially you enjoy a much more high salary, and quite often it's much more stable as opposed to the, quote, eat what you kill phenomenon 
uh, now, hopefully not in surgery, by the way, um, but generally you get more stable salaries. You're paid a salary with some productivity bonuses. That wasn't always the case, but again, declining reimbursements, increasing overhead means that suddenly you're going to be able to make more money. Also, that's oftentimes seen a better lifestyle when you join a, a hospital group. If you look at private practicing surgeons who own their own practice, over half are working over 60 hours a week and up to an eighth are working 80 hours a week in their own practices, either both with uh, their clinical work as well as their administrative work. So there are a lot of pluses on that side. Now, that being said, there are some problems with this, right? Otherwise, we'd just be sitting here saying, well, everybody should be an employee. It works best for both worlds. Well, one of the problems is the median loss to the system for a hospital to employ a physician in the private world was $176,000. That's an annual loss that they're getting every year. And so you say, well, that, how, how does that happen? Well, part of it is the exact thing we just talked about, the high salaries and benefits. There is a reason why the private practicing physician wasn't making that kind of money when they were in private practice. Part of it is they're not generating enough revenue to cover those overhead costs. And, it, and part of that is used as an incentive for them to join their system. There are advantages of the hospital systems for them to come on board. They throw them an exorbitant contract. Again, it's not the first contract. Usually it's the second contract, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but that's one of the reasons they do it. Also, there's a documented decrease in productivity once you become employed. If you look again at some of the hospital administration literature, they say that it takes at least three years, even for a, an experienced surgeon with known referral bases, to even come close to the productivity they had before they were employed. And even then, it's not where they were before, but it's a manageable amount. Now, the hospital would argue that, look, downstream revenue may help mitigate some of these losses, but the truth of the matter is, if you actually look across most systems, they do a very poor job of either tracking these revenues appropriately or even crediting them to the physicians that are generating. So I would, I would argue that the 176 number is probably a little high, but at the same point, if you're not tracking it, and if they're going to their meetings and the administration is saying this again and again, it doesn't matter if they're not tracking it appropriately. You're not getting credited for it anyway, and they're going to attribute that loss to the physician. Now, none of these problems are new, and this is really where it starts getting kind of depressing. When I started researching this topic, you start realizing how we keep making a lot of the same mistakes over and over again. And in the 90s, a very similar strategy was actually employed, and you had the rise of these things called physician practice management companies. And their thought was, well, look, and this is probably true, most physicians are terrible at managing the business aspect of a practice. And they said, look, I'm a businessman, I'll come in, I'll manage your practice for you, and all I ask is that I get a share of the profits because I'm going to make you so much more profitable because we're going to streamline all this and it'll be great. Unfortunately, due to some of the problems with controlling overhead, the decreasing productivity, which is also an observed phenomenon then, nearly all these things failed within 10 to 15 years of starting up, and those that didn't were sold off to other organizations. So if this all failed before, why are we trying this again, right? Why are we reinventing the wheel if we don't think it's going to work? Well, one of the common arguments is, well, it's different now because we have better technology now. In other words, our EMR systems help, and we can coordinate these things, we can track downstream revenue, all this stuff will make it more effective. Well, the truth of it is, number one, technology has nothing to do with the known decrease in productivity, and in fact may augment it if it's a new system for the patient. I mean, if you think about the physicians in general, when you start an EMR, there's an initial downturn in productivity just because you don't know how to use the EMR and it's not streamlined as far as workflow to make you profitable. Secondly, the IT costs alone have written, risen 42%, so it may actually be adding fuel to the fire as far as losing more money. Again, the cost savings that we were all promised when we were all mandated to go on the EMR have not really materialized in the way that I think a lot of people thought. Now, it is true that hospital systems do have more avenues to capture downstream revenue, and that's what they're kind of banking on. But again, as we said, they're not even really uh, marking these things or following them appropriately enough that you can really feel safe that maybe the hospital system is aware of what you generate. That being said, there is one major difference this time around as we're trying this experiment, and that difference can best be embodied by macro. Now, as soon as I say that, we're going to take a little bit of a hard stop. Part of that is because I see that all the attendings are already rolling their eyes because for the last three years, all of us have been hearing nothing more than about macro at pretty much every meeting we have. And the other aspect is it's going to get a little dry from here on out because we're going to have to talk about how doctors are paid by the government. And this is important for you as residents, but not because you're going to interact with it right away unless you're a PGY-5, but because you have to understand where we've been to why we got to this place that we are now. And again, I'm sorry to tell you this is not going to be a cool story. So. Fee-for-service. Fee-for-service has been traditionally how we've always been paid in the past. And it's a very simple algorithm. I'm going to try to explain this in the millennial kind of jargon with as many dank means as possible. Uh, so initially, fee-for-service is very simple. 
Yes, you did the thing, and then you asked for payment. Pay me what you owe me. I did this. Pay me for the thing. Great. Problems was, as we all know, healthcare costs haven't exactly gone down, right? And every attempt to try and rein them in has essentially failed. We could spend all day talking about all these failed experiments before, but the most recent was the sustainable growth rate. Now again, not to get into too much detail, but essentially in the late 90s, the federal government, which had been tracking some of this data before, said, look, this health care cost expenditure that we're spending, the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services are spending, are going way out of control. We need to get control of those. One of the ways to do that is to ratchet down how much we're actually paying out for services and or procedures <coughs> to physicians. And the way they calculated this is kind of complex, and it's a big algorithm. It's not a straight rate, but essentially they looked at things like what was the GDP the previous year, how much did we spend, how much did we intend to spend, and then we use an algorithm to calculate how much they needed to adjust across the board payments to physicians for services uh, from the federal government. In other words, what you're getting paid by Medicare, what you're getting paid by Medicaid. And so initially, small changes, they go up 1%, they go down 2 or 3%. It seemed to do okay if you look at this, but as you follow it, it kind of went off the rails. Now, I could again spend an hour talking about why this happened, but suffice to say, even with some fixes that tried to occur around 2006, 2007, it kept progressively spinning out of control. And even though the formula would tell them we need to cut by spending so much, they became increasingly draconian. And every year, what would happen is, is that the federal government, with the Congress, would have to sit and pass what they would call a dock fix. In other words, they'd say, yeah, I know what we're supposed to cut this year. We're not cutting it. If anything, we'll raise it by like a percent or two. And every year, they'd say, well, we'll do it next year. And then the next year would come, and they said, well, it's been a tough year. And again, 2001, you had a little bit of a downturn with the dot-com bubble. And they said, well, you know, GDP's down a little bit. We won't cut it this year, yada, yada, yada. Well, it gets to 2006. They have more problems. They, draw, they draft additional legislation saying, okay, this time we mean it. Uh, we're not going to cut this year, but next year we're really going to cut. And if you don't cut that year, you're going to have to double the cut next year. And so you get to this thing where every year they were looking at cutting the reimbursement by up to 25 to 30 percent over the previous year. And every single year, they said, well, maybe next year. Maybe next year we'll do it. Now, the problem with that is they didn't decide that January 1. They decided that usually December 21st or sometime around there where they'd actually passed the legislation, which created a lot of uncertainty in the market. There was uncertainty, of course, in the private practice offices, by the hospitals. Nobody knew what they were going to get paid. Are we going to do it? Are they going to do it this time? Are they not going to do it this time? Uncertainty usually leads to higher costs across the board, so we were compounding the air. Eventually, it got to the point where it was just so crazy, everybody involved, not just physicians, realized that SGR is non-sustainable. We cannot do this anymore. So then they say, well, they passed MACRA. Now, MACRA is the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015, and it replaced that sustainable growth rate. The goal here is to try to move away from just that plain fee-for-service arrangement that we've had for years and years to what's called a quality payment program. In other words, it's not just that you did the thing, it's that you did the thing and your outcomes are good, that your quality measures are all good, that your saving costs were appropriate, that you're being efficient. There's all kinds of measures that we can talk about, but for us, from a practical perspective, they set up essentially two tracks that you're going to get paid either what's called MIPS or APMs, and they love using these little words here because if you've not read about 15 papers on this, you're immediately lost, and that's what they want. They want an uneducated physician populace who just says, you do these things, okay, I'll do it. So MIPS basically is what's called the merit-based incentive payment system. It's based off of four metrics. The biggest of those is quality. Quality itself is based off of six metrics. So you've got nine metrics that you're supposed to be following, and the quality metrics are changed annually. And as a practice, what you're supposed to do per, per provider is essentially find out what you're doing on these metrics and every year both measure them and see how you're going to make meaningful growth. And how you perform on these metrics will determine how you're getting paid by Medicare. So it's not strictly like a fee-for-service and it's not strictly another algorithm. It's kind of a, an amalgam of the two. So it's, you've got a base rate that Medicare is going to pay all physicians, but then on top of that, depending on how you do on these measures, you're either going to go up by up to 4% or down by about 4%. So that's about an 8% swing that your practice may see initially, and then it's going to go up to at least 9% by 2022. So you're talking about a 10% on either side swing that you could be seeing for how much you're getting paid to do the exact same operation. Here's a real kicker though. Everybody initially says, well, I'll just be one of the ones that gets plus 10%. It'll be great. The problem here is, is that this is not Lake Wobegon. Not everybody can be above average, right? <laughs> Providers are actively competing against one another. And what I mean by that is, by budget neutral, it literally means in the law 
that for every provider that is at 9%, there has to be an equal provider that's at minus 9%. And it doesn't really matter, you know, and so you're really competing against each other. I mean, you try and do these metrics, but it's very possible you could be putting all this resource into data management and quality measurements and all this kind of stuff, and you're still stuck getting less with more investment. So you say, well, that sounds really terrible, and you're kind of right in some ways. I mean, it re represents in some ways a whole new administrative hurdle and expense for a private practice. It's no longer just as simple as you have a biller in your office, you say, I did this thing, bill for this thing, you send it to Medicare, you do the necessary paperwork, and they get it back to you, and they pay you three months later. Um, it represents not only an additional staff that you're going to have to do, because look, you're busy, you need to operate, you need to take care of patients, that's what we're in this for, but you need somebody tracking all this stuff. And more than that, somebody that's going to be accountable to hold your feet to the fire to do the necessary things to meet the quality measures and other measures that you're needing. Much of the burden, burden, fortunately, though, is easily scalable. And this is kind of what we're getting to here. And one of the things that we'll see is kind of driving this kind of conglomeration is the fact that the incremental expense, once you have the infrastructure set up to measure these things, the incremental expense to get some other physician on is a lot less than the initial startup cost. And so you can maybe defray some of this overhead by spreading it out over a, long, a wider base. You say, well, that stinks. What about, you said there's another way, though, a parallel way, and there is a parallel way, and that's called the APM, which is a different pathway. It still emphasizes quality, but how you're getting paid is a little different, only in the sense that the CMS now is not necessarily contracting with you directly, but with the health system to essentially do population health, where they're going to cover up a variety of patients in a population, and the entire organization then is going to be judged on these metrics and submit their metrics, and that will determine how everybody participating in that organization is going to get paid. So it's not just you as a surgeon anymore, it may be you as a surgeon along with the primary care physicians in the group, with the radiologists in the group, and you're all kind of putting your hat together. And that's essentially what an accountable care organization is supposed to be. Groups of doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers who come together voluntarily to give coordinated, <laughs> high-quality care to their Medicare patients. Now, it sounds like a sales pitch, because it is. That's right off the CMS page. Um, that's the way they phrase it. And again, the... I'm not here to be a cynic about any of this stuff. This is, I'm just presenting the facts. I, there are good reasons to do some of these things as well, I understand. This is an entity that quite honestly didn't just start with macro. I mean, the idea and the pioneer ACOs were really kind of trotted out after the uh, American Healthcare Act, affordable, excuse me, the Affordable Healthcare Act 2010, and they shut up these pilot programs. And the idea is, is that this ACO, this organization, would assume all the healthcare for a population of individuals. And therefore, if they do a great job and they save money, you'll get the share in those benefits. But if you cost money, you may be docked or you may not get paid quite as much. Now, for some of us who've been around for a little bit, this sounds awfully familiar. And, you know, the first thing is, well, it sounds like a managed care organization. Is this just managed care part two? Um, yes and no. It's not exactly a managed care organization. It's, slide up, it's set up slightly differently. First of all, patients aren't locked into an ACO. And an MCO, or managed care organization, you had to pretty much keep them there or the patients would pay a penalty. That's no longer there. Technically, it's based more off of the quality of care provided. So you're not going up and down just based purely off of what you're costing the system. It's, if you're costing them a lot, you better generate at least that you're as efficient as you can be by doing that kind of thing. And so it's based really off of meeting the metrics that they established. And again, I'm not here to argue about the metrics or if they're valid or not. The point of the matter is, is that this is the bar you have to cross. If you cross it well enough, you may get more money. Uh, but eventually, and this is, at first they're saying, you know what, it's all upside. If you do great, you'll do great. If not, no big deal, you'll just get paid at the base rate. But eventually you are going to have to pay a penalty even in an ACO. And there are multiple incentives to try and encourage physicians to join ACOs. They're going to get 5% more if you're in an, NC, an a, a accredited ACO from CMS than any of their peers. And that's in addition to whatever 4% raise or something that they may get on their own, technically speaking. And you're going to see most hospital systems are moving toward becoming ACOs in some way. And so they're kind of setting up the chairs to become these kind of organizations. Part of it is they want to guarantee a market share of the patient. We're your local MCO. The other is, is that they need service lines, though, to help provide care for the patients that they manage, which is where this whole idea of physician hiring comes in. Because even if you're not employed, you can become part of an ACO. But the problem is, is that the entire ACO, then, is responsible for the cost. And if you generate higher costs, it's going to be spread across all the ACO. And so as a result of that, they can't control you if you're independent for what your quality measures are. They, they don't have as many levers to pull. If you're an employee, it's a lot easier because they can pretty much tell you what they want you to do or not. 
So again, why are surgeons becoming employed? Well, more than ever, the financial viability of a surgical practice is tied as much to administration and quality metrics as it is to productivity. Again, you can't make it up on volume anymore. And in fact, if you looked at the SGR, one of the big problems that we had initially was when they would go down by two or three percent, the idea was is that they thought that physicians sit there and say, oh, my productivity, my payment's gone down two or three percent. I really need to look at being more efficient. Well, no, that's not how we ever solve a problem in surgery. It's just work more, right? That's our answer for everything. It's like, well, I'm down two percent. I guess I'm going to be working more. And so as a result, what happened is even when they dropped the reimbursements, the cost of, that were paid to providers actually rose because that's our answer for everything. We just work hard. That's what we do. And there are many financial incentives right now that are aligned to essentially forge surgeons to become part of ordinary, larger organizations in some way. Again, don't get me wrong. This was started well before MACRA started. I mean, in, in surgery, as far as payment goes, the ideas of paper performance, quality metrics, they've been around 15, 20 years at least, if not longer. But this is probably the most organized and concerted way that they were, we've actually gone forward with it where we've kind of jumped off that cliff. Now, some of the residents here are probably sitting there thinking about what they look for after all this career, thinking about their student loans, and you're just thinking to myself, God, I couldn't have been a dermatologist, what's going on? But I'm here to tell you there's good news. So going back to the title, is private practice general surgery dead? And the short answer is no. Now how it's, going, it's structured is going to have to change. It's just a necessary environment of where we are right now. So what will it look like then? If you're saying it's not going to end, what's it going to look like? So we'll kind of have to kind of appear in the future and kind of put our thinking caps on and think about where we're going to be. So the honest practical truth is that most people will likely, at least initially, be employed by hospitals. And that's just a simple math game, right? Right now, 86 to 90 percent of graduating residents, whether they go to fellowship or not, end up being employed. Secondly, if you look at the non-employed physicians that are out in the community still, on average, they're seven years older than their employed physicians. It's just a time game at this point because the people that want to stay so far independent are going to eventually retire or they're going to sell their practices, which is usually what we end up seeing in the local community at least, is that there are two people that end up being employed, people right out of training, people at the end of their careers where they're like, you know what, I'm tired of doing all this stuff. You're going to offer me a short-term contract. And yeah, second contract may be kind of bad, but I may not even be practicing in two to three years anyway. I may just ride this last contract out and go do what I'm going to do. But here's the other good news, and I, this is what I feel very strongly about as somebody who's still not employed, is you don't have to be an employee. There are all kinds of ways that you can structure this with partnerships and various levels of integration into a hospital system. Now don't get me wrong, I do think that you're going to have to at least be allied with a, health, a hospital system in some way, right? The idea of going to multiple systems isn't going to work. You can't, as a surgeon, you can't participate in any more than one ACO anyway. Now, there are other organizations for private insurance called CINs or Clinical Integrated Networks. I won't go into all that. It'll take forever. Uh, but the important thing is you can join these things and still remain independent. And in fact, I would say that your financial outcome may actually be better in some ways because if you do a good job of tracking your data, you can have health systems compete for your business and you to be a part of them. If you come to them with a package and say, look, here's my group. It's got 10 physicians. We're all surgeons. We do this. Here's our quality data. We monitor this, this, this. We've made these, these markers. You're safe sending your patients from your integrated network or joining this network into us because we're going to keep your costs down and we're going to provide a high quality product. There's going to be a market there for you. The other thing to keep in mind, although it all seems doom and gloom, anytime there's a new payment option, there is always an opportunity for entrepreneurship. There's always it there. Not everybody wants to deal with that. And I can understand that. I mean, surgery is a hard business itself, right? Just doing our job is tough. And it requires a lot of mental brain power. Uh, but at some point, no matter what your employment status is, know your value. When you go into these contract negotiations, know your value. And the, one of the key points here is general surgery has value. It has tremendous value out in the community and, you know, in the medical thing. You have negotiating power. Look, we don't like to brag about it, but in order to have a hospital, really, you need a general surgeon. You need at least one, right? The things that we do, all the things we do, it's not just the free air, the gallbladders, and the appendices, which get us up and we're all excited about, but even the little, what we would consider kind of lumps and bumps kind of stuff is just something that needs to be done, and it's a service that needs to be provided. Critical care, endoscopy, lumps, bumps, abscesses, all these things are things we can do. A hospital is not going to look at the bottom line, looking at that they may be losing money employing physicians and say, well, I can hire five doctors or I can hire one general surgeon. It's a pretty easy thing. We're also, as I'm sure Dr. Richardson will talk about, we're in high demand and there's a low supply right now. 
economically, that's a good thing to be. General surgery brings value to the hospital bottom line. You know, I talked before about the loss per physician. That actually doesn't apply to general surgeons. We generate roughly $2 million per year for a hospital, per surgeon, if you actually break it all down. And on top of that, you say, well, but we also cost a lot more. You know, we're in the operating room, we use resources. But they've actually studied this. And our <coughs> OR time to hospital margin is one of the most favorable of all the surgical subspecialties. You'd actually be surprised at some of the ones you think were high performers that actually cost the hospital money. Neurosurgery, plastic surgery, they are the worst as far as you look at what their cost for hospital margin for OR time is. More than that, as I said, some of these positions aren't meeting their own costs. We may be called on to subsidize some of those people because of our productivity. So they want you and they need you. But I think really the biggest value we have is that we're leaders. Surgeons are leaders. And part of the reason is I think we're uniquely qualified to participate in the hospital and health system leadership. We clinically collaborate with pretty much every facet of the hospital system. We interact with or are involved with every part of it. We're in the OR, we're in the endoscopy suite, we deal with critical care, we deal with cancer oncology, all these different aspects, there's a general surgeon involved there somewhere, okay? We have special insight into some of the internal problems that they all deal with, that a lot of providers, quite frankly, don't get. I mean, they're all smart people too, but if you ask a hospitalist anything about how the OR functions, it might as well be a black box. They don't know, something goes in, somebody comes out. We know some of the special <laughs> problems that, that are in, in those particular areas. We're trained to be independent thinkers who are value efficiency and quality. It's just like learning how to operate. You know, it's like the old saying, there are good fast surgeons, there are bad fast surgeons, but there are no good slow surgeons, right? I mean, efficiency is kind of beaten into us. And we're assertive enough to fight the necessary fights, but in a professional manner. And I think that last point kind of sums up kind of what I'm getting at and what I think is so well exemplified by Richard Schwartz was Richard Schwartz was a leader. He was a leader not only educationally, nationally, locally. He was involved in not only in leadership of his church, he was involved in the administrative leadership of the hospital, helping with medical students. I mean, in every aspect, he was a leader who was not shared to pick up the good fight when he needed to pick up the good fight, but he always did it professionally. He always did it in a way that was respectful but he, he also wouldn't let go of it until it was accomplished the right way for the good of the patients and the good of the students. And anytime I think about the challenges, and there are challenges in front of general surgery, make no mistake, I'm sure we're going to be able to overcome them. And I always think about this quote because Richard actually had this embroidered on his wall. And it's an old Calvin Schoolis quote, and I won't read it off for you, but the ideas here are the ideas of persistence and the press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. And one thing the surgeons were very good about is continuing the hard fights when needed. So I should thank everybody for letting me come and uh, bore the medical students and residents for a while with the economics of healthcare currently. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.